لمحمد خير الشمائل وكامل وهي الدلاء الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين حبيبنا الشفينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعض السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome once more to our Sira class. <clears throat> the last thing we were speaking about was uh, we had spoken about all the lessons that we can learn. We can learn from being a shepherd, and the lessons that the messenger of, uh, messengers of Allah had learned from being a shepherd. And we also went on to speak about why specifically sheep. Why specifically sheep? And one of the things that we began discussing was sheep, they are very weak animals. They are very weak and they tend to be very compassionate. So the shepherd has to be merciful and kind with them because they are very fragile animals. They are very fragile animals. So Allah Rabbil Azza, he taught them to be compassionate, to be merciful, to be forgiven through the shepherding of sheep. Uh, camels can be very arrogant at some, uh, sometimes. So you have to meet that arrogance with strength. You have to meet the arrogance of the camel with strength. Now, we know of the incident, uh, when we speak about the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, most of us can recollect the incident of a Ta'if. He went to give the people of Ta'if Dawah. And uh, whilst he, he was there, he went, now he went specifically to the chiefs. He didn't go to the common man in Ta'if. He went to the chief and he asked them to, you know, keep it quiet. This uh, conversation, let's just keep it between ourselves. But they let loose their treacherous people on him. And they stone them out and, I mean, if somebody chased you from a community, you look to take some form of revenge. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did? When Allah Rabbil Izza, he sent the two angels that were overlooking Al-Akhshabayn, the two mountains that were overlooking at taif And he said, if you wish, by the power of Allah, we can cause these mountains to crumble on these people and killing them. We know of that incident. And a person can say, you know, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was so merciful. Now that was only one day. I mean, he just went in Taif, they chased him out, and as against 13 years of being persecuted, 13 years in Makkah, he had to put up with the persecution of the Quraysh. For 13 years, he had to face the slanders of the people. For 13 years, they tried their utmost to defame him and to taint his character. For 13 years, his companions were going through sufferings. And when they tried to migrate to Abyssinia, that was the first migration to Abyssinia, I mean, the Sahabas who became Muslims, their migration to Abyssinia, it did not hurt the political status of Makkah in any way. It did not affect the economy in any way. Just because they became Muslim. The Quraysh, they could not stand the fact that our relatives accepted the religion of Muhammad. That is, they, they could not stand that. So they sent a delegation all the way to Abyssinia to bring them back. This is the extent they will go. Only because you become Muslim. That is the only reason. Not because of status or anything like that. Only because you became a Muslim. After 13 years of persecution, when the Prophet ﷺ re-entered Makkah, on Fathul Makkah, the conquest of Makkah, now he entered with a very strong army. And the Quraysh, they were, they were running all over. I mean, they were scared out of their wits. Now Muhammad has taken Makkah. 
He will seek revenge for all the years of persecution. This is what was going through their minds. And everyone was probably recollecting in their minds the things they used to do, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions. I mean, it's not easy to have to face uh, all those things for 13 years. It's, it's not easy. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered Mecca, he commanded his companions to gather the people, to bring the people, to ga gather the people. And he looked at the people and he said, what do you expect of me today? What do you expect of me today? One of their spokesperson, he said, you are our noble brother. I mean, now he's a noble person. 13 years, he was all sorts of things. Now he's a noble person. He said, you are our noble brother, son of a noble brother, and we expect nothing but goodness from you. I mean, what is mercy really? If someone were to ask you, brother, can you define mercy for me? What, I mean, what are you gonna, what are you gonna say? Mercy is to be merciful. I mean, that doesn't answer the question. What is the meaning of mercy? Mercy means an act of compassion over those whom you have power and authority over. It is an act of compassion in overlooking those above or over whom you have authority. Now you can take action. Now you can take revenge. Now you can take revenge for all they have done to you. For all these times. And it is not only 13 years when they went to Medina. Still the Quraysh were try waging wars. Still they were riding with their armies and coming to fight the Muslims and rout them. So it did not stop. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to them, Today I will tell you the same thing that Yusuf Alaihi Salam said to his brothers. And we all know the incident of Yusuf Alaihi Salam. Today I will tell you the same thing that Yusuf Alaihi Salam said to his brothers. And it's mentioned in Surah Yusuf, verse 92, Allah Rabbi al Izzah, he says, Qala la tathriba alaykum al No blame on you today. No revenge today. No blame. Yaghfirullahu lakum. Allah will forgive you. Allah will forgive you for what you have done. Wa huwa arhamur rahimin. And Allah is the most forgiven. He is the one who shows the most, most amount of mercy. So when we speak about mercy, when we speak about mercy, and we speak about Allah is Ar-Rahman, last week I mentioned that, it's as though the Prophet ﷺ was an embodiment of that mercy. You know, we can speak about mercy all we want, but unless someone can show us how to be merciful, and we can read uh, lots of books on mercy. We can read lots of books on how to be a merciful person. And from the moment something happens, we snap. From the moment something happens to us, we just go back to our normal ways. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he shows us how to be merciful. How did he learn that? How did he learn that? Allah trained them. He taught them mercy by their jobs. Because a job can have a very powerful influence on a person. It has a very adverse effect on our personalities, our jobs. Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani alayhi rahmah, he says, The wisdom behind having the prophets as shepherds before prophethood is that they may become skilled in herding their flock, and they would be responsible for their represented, uh, respective nations in the future. In herding, one attains forbearance and mercy, and it imbues patience. For when a shepherd is obliged to gather his flock and herd it from one area to another area at once, protecting the flock from predators, he has thus attained the skills necessary to lead a nation and protect it from its enemies, both within and outwardly. Thus, the prophets lead with patience, 
when leading their people and obtain the understanding of different natures of people. They learn to show kindness to the weak and resolve within the dominant. We move on to another incident that occurred in the early days of the Prophet wasallam, and that was his trip with his uncle to Asham, to Syria. At that time, Syria was ruled by the Romans. And the eastern part of the Roman Empire was known as the Byzantine Empire, uh, which ruled over, amongst other countries, Syria and uh, Asia, Palestine, Egypt, and the northern part of Africa. Its capital was Constantinople. This empire was a very, very wicked empire. And I think it was in our first session, our second session, we spoke about why Allah had selected Makkah? Why Allah had selected the Arabs? And uh, just to recap uh, what I said, it was that many people have this dark picture of the Arabs, that they were the worst people in civilization at that time, and it's because of them we call that period the Dark Ages, which is untrue. It was untrue. Because the Arabs, amongst all of them, possess the best qualities. Even though, I mean, if we were to ask them, well, what, what made them the worst people on the face of the earth? Only one thing might probably come up. They used to bury their girl children alive. That's it. People are doing it today. Any nation you go to today, people are killing children and raping children, and children are just vanishing off the face of the earth. So it's still around. Do we call this period the Dark Ages? Or do we say, well, this country, because of them, we will call, you know, this period in time the Dark Ages, or we will call them the Dark Country or something like that. Hey, people don't do that. People don't do that. So because of one thing, because of one thing, they say, well, you know, it was the Dark Period and the Arabs were the worst people. The Romans used to do worse. And if they did not do this, then whatever they did equated what they used to do, what the Arabs used to do. So the Romans, they used to subject their people to a lot of oppression and wrongdoings. So Abu Talib, he would often travel to Syria and elsewhere on his business trips. On one such occasion, he took Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa around at that time. Some uh, scholars say that he was 10. Some scholars say he was 12. A disputing over his age is not an issue. The fact of the matter is that he made a journey. And something happened on that journey. Also accompanying them was some of the, trips, uh, the chiefs of the Quraysh from Makkah. So they stopped and they camped at an area. And their caravan had overlooked a monastery of the Mount Buhaira. Of course, you will see in some books, Buhaira, you will see in some books, Bahira. The person's name is the same. As they began, <coughs> as they began unpacking to set up camp, they noticed that the monk was coming in their direction. And I mean, this was something strange. I mean, so many times we pass here, so many times we camp here, and this monk, he never came over. Not once he ever, you know, came over to say something or to ask something, but now he's coming over, I mean something, you know, I mean something is going on. As they were removing some of their things, Buhaira, he, he came and he started to walk in between. He started to walk in between and he stopped and he took Muhammad by his arm and he said, this is the chief of mankind and the jinns. This is the chief of mankind and the jinn. This is the messenger of Allah. This is the messenger of the Lord of all that exists. Allah has sent him as a mercy to all that exists. So the chief of the Quraysh, I mean, this is something strange to them. This is something new to them. He said, well, why are you saying this? He said, Firstly, when you overlook this place, as you was arriving from Al-Aqaba, every tree that you pass 
bow down in prostration and they do not perform prostration for anyone except that he's a messenger of Allah. Another thing he said, I also know that he is a messenger from Allah because of the seal of prophethood that resembles something like an apple just beneath his shoulder blades. So Buhaira, he asked them to have a meal with him. And as he was walking towards the shade of the trees, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, was, he went out to attend to the camels. And when he, Buhaira asked them to have a meal and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was coming back from the camels, he noticed that the shade, the clouds were shading him. The clouds were shading him and he said, look, the, 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 cloud, the shade of the cloud is shading him. When the Prophet وسلم, he reached, all the trees, the shade of the trees was taken. So he sat down and the shade from the trees, it moved and covered him. It moved and covered him and he said, look at this. He said, this is why I know that he's a messenger from Allah. Bahira, he told Abu Talib that to take back, he must return with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Makkah because the Romans, their, their fortune tellers, had foretold the coming of a messenger. And the, kings, the, the king and the leaders, they feared that the coming of a messenger means the end of their reign. Because all the people that were their loyal subjects now had someone to turn to for justice. All the people who were their slaves now had someone to turn to for justice. All the people who were underneath them and they treated as nothing with no rights. The woman, the poor, the needy, the weak, now they had someone to turn to. So they feared an uprising. So let's get rid of this prophet so that our kingdom will continue to reign. Abu Talib, he took the Prophet ﷺ back to Mecca safely. <clears throat> the next important incident that occurred in the life of the Prophet ﷺ and the Messenger of Allah, he was around 20 years of age when this incident occurred. It was a pact called Hilful Fudul. Hilful Fudul means a pledge of allegiance or the Fudul Alliance. It's, you know, people translate it differently. A pact of allegiance the Fudul Alliance, the Pledge of Allegiance. The origin of this is that a man from the Zubaid region in Yemen, he came into Mecca to trade. And uh, when he came into Mecca, As ibn al-Wa'il, he took the goods from the man. Mecca was a central trade zone. So people will come in and then they will go to the neighboring areas. So Asim al Wail, he took the, the belongings of the man and he said, I, I will pay you. I'm going to pay you. Asim al Wail, he sold the man goods. Excuse. He sold the man goods. And instead of paying the man, he looked the man straight up in his face and said, I'm not going to pay you. He said, I'm not going to pay you. Now, Asim al Wail, he thought that because the man being a foreigner, he would just leave and go back. I mean, if someone comes to Trinidad and to do trade and you rip him off in you know, simple terms, you, you, you will just vanish in Trinidad because you know all the nooks and corners in Trinidad and this poor guy will be running all over the place and asking and seeking help. And, you know I mean, but you expect that this person will become despondent and he will just go back to his, he will just go back to his uh, country or wherever he came from. Asim al Wail, he thought the same thing. But the man, he went by Al Kaaba and he started to speak with a loud voice. <coughs> and he said, I was oppressed in your land, and are you people who are going to stand? Are you people who are going to stand up for my rights? At first, the uh, the people of the leaders of the Quraysh, they did not pay much attention because Asim al Wail was from amongst the chiefs of the Quraysh. So they didn't pay much attention to him. The man said, will you allow this oppression to happen in your land? And he went on and he said uh, some more emotional words. 
some of the clans of the Quraysh, uh, what happened is that Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib, he was sitting there and he heard the cries of the man and he stood up and with a loud voice he said, isn't anyone going to help this man? Isn't anyone going to support this man? So some of the leaders of the Quraysh, they came together and they decided to meet and bring about an agreement in protecting the rights of the weak uh, and the travelers who come to do trade in Mecca. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, my uncles took me with them to attend this meeting. And the meeting was held in the house of Abdullah ibn Ja'adan. Now Abdullah ibn Ja'adan, he was a very, very generous person. He was a very kind person and he, he was a type of person who always stood up for the rights of people, despite who you were. So they came together and they made an agreement that we will stand together to protect the rights of the oppressed and the weak. Now this incident, it happened when the Prophet ﷺ was around 20 years of age. And Nabuwat wasn't bestowed upon him as yet. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said, after he received wahi, after he received revelation, after Nabuwat was endowed upon him, he said, I witness in the house of Abdullah bin Ja'adan a pact made that I would not have exchanged it for the choices of herds. That, that's right, red camels. Now, a red camel, I mean, we might think, well, a, a camel? What's the value of a camel? Well, a red camel back then was like a Mercedes Benz to us today. You know, you see a person driving a Mercedes Benz, yeah, that, that's serious people. You don't see Mercedes and BMWs and you know, these uh, expensive cars crashing on the highway. You don't see these things because serious-minded people drive these vehicles. You don't see young boys, you know, just all over the place speeding up and down. It's, I mean, it's, it's very costly to maintain these vehicles. So when you hear of a red camel, it is not, you know, a cheap, skinny, lean, you know, camel. When, uh, they, when they had set out a bounty on the head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Jahal, and, uh, the head of uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was 100 red camels each. So the price was high. I mean, that's an expensive pack. It's an expensive herd of camels. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I witness in the house of Abdullah bin Ja'adan, an agreement being signed, a pact being made, that I would, not have, I would not exchange it for the choices of herds. He went on to say, and if I had been suggested to it after Islam, I would respond to it positively. I would respond to it positively. He went on to say, if I'm invited to it today, Meaning after he had received Nabuwat. After the meeting, after the message of Islam has been given to me, I would have still responded to it. Listen to his last statement, what he said. I would have still responded to it even though it was held by non-Muslims. Even though that treaty or that alliance or that pledge it was signed, it was held by non-Muslims, if it is presented to me today, after Nabuwat was endowed upon me, even though it was signed and held by non-Muslims, I would still respond to it positively. Still. What does this teach us? <clears throat> Excuse. One. Muslims must learn and listen to this carefully. Many times we say, yes, you know, well, yeah, you know, um, I, I side with what is right and, you know, I mean, I'm, yeah, we good and, and we well, go on mumbling some stuff. Muslims should side. They must learn to side with what is right. 
We need to learn to side with what is right, no matter what the source is. No matter where it's coming from. Secondly, Muslims must stand for human rights. Because this is what the Prophet ﷺ came with. This is what he came with. Women were being mistreated, he gave women their rights. The slaves were being mistreated, he gave them their rights. The orphans were being mistreated, he gave them their rights. The rights between family members, the rights of inheritance, the rights of the neighbors. And it's sad today to, to see and hear how Muslims treat their neighbors. And Allah speaks about the neighbor on the right, the neighbor on the left. The Quran speaks about the neighbor that is a Muslim, the neighbor that is a Muslim and your relative. And sometimes they are the worst to be treated by you. The relative who is a Muslim who lives next to you. The neighbor who is three houses down the road. How you should treat them. And sometimes when we hear about this, we start stupsing and twisting our faces and fuming and turning from side to side. And we want to get up and leave the audience. Why? Because, you know, what is being said here is affecting us. As we say, fall in your garden. Yeah, fall in your garden. So we need to stand up for human rights. We must stand up for those who are oppressed. Those who are mistreated. Muslims must stand up for the needy, the poor, the weak amongst us, despite their religious background. Because the thing in society is that if you are Muslim, well, yeah, I, I will try to help you. And sometimes they don't even get help. And if you are not Muslim, well, hard luck. I mean, nothing for you to do. If you are not Muslim, you belong to some other religious denomination. I mean, you go up the road or something like that. And this is very bad. The Prophet wasallam. remember I said earlier on, him living in Makkah for 13 years, he lived among non-Muslims. He lived among non-Muslims and the situation then, it's as a reflection of our situation. We live among non-Muslims. Our neighbors are non-Muslims. Our friends and at our jobs are sometimes non-Muslims. We grew up and our friends at college, they are non-Muslims. How do we treat them? Because we are Muslim, we treat them badly. If your neighbor is a non-Muslim and when he needs your help, uh, you does not help him. Is that, is that right? That that's unright. And that's very unsmart of a Muslim. So despite their religious background, we need to stand up for the needy, the weak, no matter what religion they belong to. We must stand up for what is good and right. This is very, very important. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, if this treaty that was signed between non-Muslims were given to me today, I would have accepted it. Why? Because it stands up for justice. It stands up for the oppressed. It stands up for the weak. It stands up for the traveler, the wayfarer. It gives support to the weak and the oppressed ones. And we all know that statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said that the dua of the mazloom is accepted by Allah. And there is no hijab between Allah and that person. And sometimes we think that, you know, it means that, well, I was oppressed today and I, I will go home and I will uh, bathe and uh, put on some clean clothes and then I will go and sit down and make dua. And you plan what to say. Well, I will say this and I will say that and oh Allah, you see? You see what he do, man? Of course he saw. It is, should not be a planned thing. It should be something spontaneous. Besides, the dua that the Prophet ﷺ was speaking about, it's not like that. The dua of the oppressed person is accepted by Allah. It means at the time of you being oppressed, the pain and the hurt which you feel in your heart at that moment, that dua which you make here. Because the uh, uh, same thing goes for patients. You know, sometimes we are struck with some calamity. And uh, probably, you know, the death of 
a close relative, our mother, our father, our child. And uh, we wail and we cry and we beat up ourselves and pull up our hair and, you know, and everybody we see, of course, it's a time for mourning. So we throw on a good cry, looking for sympathy here and sympathy there. And, and probably a week or two later, then you say, well, you know, the imam, he said I should be patient, so I will have patience. And then we think that that's patience. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, patience, true patience, is at the time of every calamity. At the time of every calamity, not two weeks down the road. It's not something planned. Well, I'm planning to have patience. How do you plan to have patience? You don't plan to have patience. So the dua of the mazloom is at the time of you be a, a person being oppressed. In the end, the man, because of the treaty that was signed, the man was given back his belongings. An next very important event in the early life of the Prophet ﷺ was his marriage to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Now this is a very remarkable lady. And uh, sometimes it's very important to, in fact, it's very important for us to learn of these personalities. It's very, very important, especially our sisters. It's very important for men also to learn of a personality like Khadija radiallahu ta'ala an. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala an, in her time, uh, she was not married. She, she was married previously. And there is a difference of opinion with respect to whether her husband had died or there, there was a divorce between you know, Khadija and her husband. Nevertheless, she was known in Mecca as the pure woman. This is how people knew Khadija. She was a pure-mannered woman, a very beautiful, chaste. And because of her first marriage experience, it sort of kind of turned her mind, her mind away from marriage. Ibn Ishaq, he says, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was the first to believe in Allah. She was the first to believe in Allah and his messenger. And in all that he brought, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he never heard an unpleasant thing from Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha whenever she would speak to him. One of the greatest qualities of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha is that she had invested all of her wealth for the sake of Allah and his religion. All of her wealth. She generously gave, unlimitedly. She spent without even making mention of anything which she spent. She never allowed herself, she, or she never allowed the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to work and she never complained of him not having a job. She never complained. All his occupation was, was calling people towards Islam. Her kindness, her spending on the weak, the poor Muslims was unmatched. Her generosity was extreme. And no doubt the title of Mahatul Mu'mineen suited her in every sense of this, this title. This title, mother of the believers, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was a true mother. In the true sense of the word mother, she fitted that description perfectly. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. She was filled with faithfulness, integrity, and truthfulness, and modesty, good manners, nobility, generosity. She was full of understanding and wisdom. She was very supportive to the message. And she sacrificed all her comforts of life for the message of Allah and the message. She was a dedicated companion to the Prophet during the most difficult period in his life. 
Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was there. Through the most difficult period in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was there, radiallahu ta'ala anha was there. She was the greatest supporter in the most crucial days of the life in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala she says, that whenever the Prophet ﷺ would speak about Khadija, it was in terms of the highest praise. He will speak about Khadija in the highest of words. And uh, once Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, she said something, she said something displeasing to the Prophet ﷺ about Khadija. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said very calmly, he said, I have not found a better wife than her. He said, she had faith in me when everyone, even members of my own family, members of my own tribe, they turned their backs on me and they did not believe in me and they did not accept the message. And I was truly, that I was truly a messenger. And I brought this message from Allah when no one accepted me. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala accepted me. She spent all of her wealth on me and the message. She spent all her worldly goods in order to help me spread this religion of Allah. He said, and this too, this too occurred at a time when the entire world turned against me and persecuted me. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was there. So don't say anything about her. Don't say anything about her. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala, she died on the 20th of Ramadan, three years prior to the Hijrah. She died when she was uh, 65 years of age. Her grave was prepared at a place called Hujun near Makkah, and the Prophet sallallahu himself buried her. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, when she described Khadija radiallahu ta'ala, she said, she was a pleasant woman. This is what she heard. She was a pleasant wo woman, and no one saw her except that they became captivated by her. No one saw her except that she became captivated by her. So, she was a wealthy woman in Makkah, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala. And she wasn't married, and she was, of course, everyone knows, I mean, this is basic stuff. From a very young age, we learned uh, that the Prophet sallallahu was 25, and Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was 40. She used to hire men to travel and do the business for her. I mean, you can't have a woman traveling and a tradeswoman. It's very difficult. The trade was from Makkah and, and other Syria and Yemen and all these places. And uh, she ran into some problems with uh, honesty and, I mean, the honesty of the men. I'm not saying that men are dishonest today. Okay? So she heard about the honesty of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she hired Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do her trade business. She had a servant accompany the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on that trade trip. His name was Maisara. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went to Sham, he came back, and Maisara, he reported to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala and her. And he said, now Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he does not know you know that he went and he spoke these words. He said, this man Muhammad, this man Muhammad, his honesty, his trustworthiness, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's outstanding. And as he was, you know, praising the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khadija was becoming more and more interested in him. Because of his character, you know, she, he was, it made him very admirable. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala, I mean, she was a wealthy woman in Makkah and she was sought after by many of the leaders of the Quraysh. So she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and she proposed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, will you marry me? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam agreed. He was 25 and she was 40. 
The Prophet ﷺ, he never married anyone else as long as he was married to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. He never took a second wife. <coughs> all of her children, all of the children that he had was from Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Their names were Zainab, Uqayya, Um Kulthum, Fatima, Abul Qasim, and Abdullah. None of them having, uh, ended up having any descendants except Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. And that is where the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu continues through Fatima radiallahu ta'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu himself had a lot of love and admiration for Khadija radiallahu ta'ala and her. Because she loved and she supported the, the message. Whilst everyone betrayed him, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was there to support him. Both physically, financially, and also morally. When he would come home after being abused, she would be there to support and comfort him. Now Aisha radiallahu ta'ala was the most beloved to the Prophet sallallahu after that. She would sometimes, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala would sometimes feel jealous. And in, it's mentioned, an incident is mentioned uh, by uh, Shaykh Hain, Imam Muslim and Imam Bukhari, where she says that, I did not become jealous of any of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except Khadija Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha. And I have never seen her. The Messenger of Allah would sometimes slaughter a sheep and say, send it to the friends of Khadija. Send it to the friends of Khadija. So not only did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remember her, but he maintained he maintained a good relationship with the relatives and the friends of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala even after her death, which is something that does not really happen today. When if your, your wife or the husband dies, well, that's it. Cousins will be passing each other straight like strangers on the road. No one visits no one anymore and... You know, the family becomes disconnected. The family becomes disconnected. And I'm sure there are so many people who are relatives to each other and they don't even know they are relatives. Because we, we tend to take that very lightly. You know, knowing who your family is. It was a custom amongst the Arabs that they used to trace their lineage and they used to know all who their, whom their relatives were. Today, if you ask a child, what's the name of your grandfather, he doesn't know. Some of them don't, they don't even know the name of, names of their fathers. Much more for their grandfathers and their grandmothers. They don't know where they came from. They don't know who their relatives are. And it's, it, everything just becomes disconnected. And you end up passing your relatives straight on the roads. Your cousins, you become disconnected. This was not a custom from amongst the Arabs. They remain connected. They remain connected to each other. So the Prophet ﷺ, he used to do this, and he would maintain a good relationship. One day, she said, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, she said, I angered the Prophet ﷺ, and he said, I have been given by Allah the love of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And this was years after she passed away. Was years after she passed away. But the Prophet ﷺ, he never forgot Khadija radiallahu ta'ala as long as he lived. Because she stood alongside him in his most difficult of moments. How can you forget someone like that? How can you forget someone who has invested all of their wealth in your uh, message? How can you forget someone who invested their comfort and their life towards the message of Islam, towards supporting your, uh, your message? towards supporting this task which you have undertaken. <coughs> Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was one of the four of the greatest women that ever lived. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says that the greatest of women that ever set foot on the face of the earth, they are four in numbers. Uh, number one, Maryam bin Imran. Bint Imran. Uh, number two, Khadija bin Khuwailad radiallahu ta'ala anha. <coughs> Number three, Fatima bint Muhammad. 
and number four, Asya, the wife of Fir'aun. The greatest amongst them, the greatest amongst them, as Allah Himself mentions it in the Quran, Allah Rabbi Al Azza, He says in Surah Al Imran, with Qalatil Malaikatu Ya Maryam, Inna Allah has tafaki wa tahariki wa tafaki ala nisa il alamin, O Maryam, Inna Allah has tafaki, Allah has chosen you, wa tahariki, and Allah has purified you. وَاسْتَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ And Allah has chosen you above all the women of, on the face of the earth. <clears throat> he has chosen you. So the Quran itself testifies to who is the greatest of them. Maryam bint Imran. Second is Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Number three is Fatima bint Muhammad. And number four is Asiya. Now, all of these women, they had something to do with a messenger. Two were responsible for nurturing and bringing up uh, messengers. <clears throat> Maryam bint Imran uh, brought up Isa alayhi salam. And uh, Asiya, she brought up Musa alayhi salam. The stranger, he was brought up in the house of his enemy, Fir'aun. He was uh, fed, he was pampered, he was clothed, he was taken good care of in the house of his biggest enemy, Fir'aun. And uh, then Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was the wife of the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and Fatima was the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he reaches the age of 25 in an area in a time when fornication was widespread. And at that time, there were four different types of relationship. So you had the traditional marriage that used to take place. Secondly, you had the brothels, where the young men of Makkah, they will go to satisfy their, themselves. Thirdly, you had a very strange type of relationship where a woman, she would sleep with a group of men, and the group sometimes used to go until about 10. And when the child is born, and she delivers, she delivers the child, she can call these men, and then pick one out of the 10 and say, this is your child. A very strange relationship. Fourthly, uh, you had another very strange type of relationship where a man will allow his wife to sleep with someone of nobility just to have his son of noble lineage. So it was the society was corrupted. The society was corrupted. <clears throat> so it was a quite corrupt environment for a young man growing up. It was not easy for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he lives up to this age Fighting off the tide of the ignorance that, you know, that was present at his, at his time. And at the age of 25, now this is very important for us to understand. At the age of 25, he chooses to marry a woman who is 40. 15 years older than him. Now, today if a man is going to marry a woman, and she is a few months older than him, that's a problem. I can't have my wife older than me. And you know, it's like that. Well, if she's a few years, forget it. Forget that's not going to happen. Unless in exceptional cases. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was 25, and Khadija radiallahu ta'ala, she was 40. Not only that, she was in a previous marriage. And this is another thing. Someone is going to get married and they hears that, well, you know, she was married before, okay, oh yeah? So why she divorced? Find out why she divorced. I ain't waiting to find out. <laughs> find out first. You understand? And we look at all these things. The Prophet Sallallahu married her again. He married Khadija radiallahu ta'ala when he was 25. She was 40. Not only she was 40, 
she had was she was in a previous marriage the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he remains with khadija radiyallahu ta'ala until he reaches the age of 50 and during that period of time he did not take a second wife he did not take a second wife khadija radiyallahu ta'ala passes away and the Messenger of Allah remained a bachelor for about two or three years. And later on, he married a widow, Sauda, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Now, now, the reason he married Sauda was because Sauda was in Abyssinia. She came back to Mecca and her husband passed away. And uh, people started to go around, of course, well, the Quraysh. They started to say that, oh, Muhammad is sending his, uh, his companions off and they are dying doing this and they are dying doing that and no one is taking care of their wives. So there was no one to take care of Sawra radiallahu ta'ala and her. She doesn't have anyone to, <coughs> to provide for her. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he married her. Now she was old. She was old. She wasn't young. Suddenly, in the last 10 years of the Prophet Sallallahu life, he marries multiple wives. He marries multiple wives. Another one of those whom he married was Juwairiya bint Al-Harith. Now, this Juwairiya wasn't her original name. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu gave her the name Juwairiya, and Juwairiya was a word that was used to show an expression of praise or love, Juwairiya. Now when we hear the name Juwairiya, we say, me going to name my daughter that. But Juwairiya was a word that was used to show the expression of praise and love. So it was a very beautiful name. Her name before that was Barra. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he named her Juwairiya. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and she said, I did not know of a woman who brought greater blessings to her people more than Juwairiya. More than Juwairiya. She was the daughter of the leader of the tribe of Banu Mustalik. Now, Banu Mustalik was one of those tribes that waged war against Islam. And uh, when the, one of the battles, the, battles, the battle of Moraisi, they lost in the battle of Moraisi and uh, Juwairiya was held as a captive. So she was taken as a captive. However, she came to ransom herself and she said to the Prophet wasallam, I fell in the share of Thabit bin Qais and I agree with him to ransom myself with nine uqiyya. Now, one uqiyya, an uqiyya is a weight of gold. They used to use to weigh. Today we have pongs and ounces. Back then, they used to use an uqiyya, it's a weight. So nine uqiyya of gold. She said, I came to ransom myself. But then she said to the Prophet wasallam, can you please help me to ransom myself? She didn't have, she didn't have it. The Prophet wasallam. we just finished the sun, we'll stop. The Prophet wasallam. he said, do you want something better than that? Do you want something better than that? She said, what is it? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I will pay it on your behalf and then you marry me. And she said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. When she said, yes, O Messenger of Allah, this statement alone was enough to indicate her Islam. We'll stop there, inshallah, and we'll continue next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لمحمد خير الشمائل وكامل وهي الدلائل أخلاقه القرآن والرحمن في التنزيل قائل لمحمد خير الشمائل وكامله